So this talk is a tutorial, but if I have time for the last five minutes, I also highlight some of the ongoing research in my lab. Mostly, you know, like just formulating the problems and sort of like some other applications of deep learning other than genomics. That is the focus of this tutorial. So I'm Iman Haji Rasuliha. I'm an associate professor at Wildcorn and Medicine in New York City. So my lab is mainly focused on genome sequencing technology and biology, basically characterizing uh, human genomes, cancer genomes, metagenomics data sets. Also, uh, a lot of students in the lab work on deep learning image classifications for a wide range of uh, classification tasks and biomedical data sets. I'll probably uh, highlight a few of them in this talk as well. Uh, so let's just begin with some basic introduction on human genome. I know a lot of experts are in the room, so just uh, uh, to get everyone on the same page, we know that we have a reference genome as a result of the Human Genome Project in 2003, but also most recently as a result of the T2T project, we have uh, filled up uh, most of the gaps in the reference genome. So we pretty much have a gapless reference genome now. And when you look at all the individuals uh, and other genomes that we sequence, there is obviously variation. And we heard a lot about, you know, single nucleotide variants in the past few days, uh, just base pair changes, or, you know, like small insertions or deletions. But we have also large scale structure variations in genomes. And in fact, like, uh, altogether, totally, structure variations actually affect more base pair when you compare with uh, just single nucleotide variants. So structure variations come in uh, a lot of different forms. You can see on this figure, we, we can have like duplication, a, a, a chunk of genome is duplicated, deletions, insertions of new sequences, or more complex events, for example, translocations, where two uh, parts of different chromosome swap place, or inversion where a chunk of genome is inverted. It can also be, you know, more complex variation. They can be like overlapping events or events with like uh, multiple breakpoints. And uh, a structure variation actually can cause diseases. So there is this uh, famous example of a, this Philadelphia chromosome. This is a large scale uh, translocation between chromosome 9 and 22. And as you can see on this figure, the chromosomes break at these locations. We call them breakpoints. They trade these segments. And this causes a gene fusion, which is uh, causing a majority of CML, a form of leukemia. And you can also see it in other forms of leukemia as well. So like a single SV can cause this severe effect. Uh, on this figure, I actually want to highlight a smaller insertion. This is only like a 353 base pair insertion in, in a, a gene known as MAC. And as you can see, this tiny insertion can cause this retinitis pigmentosus disease. So even like a very small insertion compared to the full human genome, which is 3 billion letters, can have a very severe effect. And in fact, for this example, this insertion was an actually a repeat element, an all insertion. And there's a story behind this. Initially, when these researchers actually were studying this uh, insertion, they missed it because they were using next generation sequencing techniques. And the algorithm that they, they, they were using actually ignored you know, multi-mapped reads. So later, through some Sanger sequencing and some manual inspection, they actually found this uh, insertion in their, in their data set. So it's also important to you know, characterize all sorts of variations, especially in repetitive regions of the human genome. So right now, we have these wonderful technologies, like especially whole genome sequencing, that you can actually sequence genomes very quickly and uh, quite cheap, actually, relatively. But these technologies all give you readouts of the genome. You cannot sequence full genome from you know, like one end of the chromosome to the end of the chromosome. So for the most part, there are two main type of these technologies, short read sequencing. Uh, Illumina sequencing is the majority of sequencing being done, you probably know. The upside is you don't need a lot of DNA input. You can do it in a high throughput fashion very cheaply. Uh, and the error rate is, uh, the base pair error rate is pretty low. But as you know, you get only like short reads, like 50 base pair to 100 base pair. We have also long read sequencing. These technologies are still like improving, uh, like PacBio or Oxford Nanopore. You get longer reads, you know, like 10 KB to like even 
some examples of a mega based read, but you often need a lot of eDNA as input. Uh, it's still like pretty expensive, although like the cost is going down, and it's less accurate relative to Illumina sequencing. So if I want to highlight like what is parent shortage sequencing, you have DNA in the cells. The DNA is fragmented into many, many overlapping fragments. Uh, so these are the short fragments, 400 base pair, 500 base pair. And the machine would read both ends of these fragments. So you have, say, 100 base pair from the left end, 100 base pair from the right end. And often, you know, like this distance, so we call this an insert size. It's coming from this tight distribution. So from your sequencing library, you would know you know, the estimate of uh, these fragment lengths. And you know, like, more than a decade ago, people started using this uh, short sequencing to infer structure variations. So there are still like methods being developed, but the main idea is this concept of resequencing. You would align all your short reads back to reference genome and look for these discordances in the mappings. For example, this is green read that I'm highlighting here. So you expect, you know, like a certain distance between the ends, but when you map to the reference genome, you, you see a larger distance. And that can indicate, you know, like a large deletion. But as I said, uh, because these uh, uh, reads are short, and the human genome is actually very repetitive, almost like half of the genome is, you know, like uh, all the repeats or, you know, L1 repeats, you know, segmental duplications, and like a lot of different repeat families. Some of these reads, you know, like map to multiple locations. And it's actually very challenging to identify the correct mapping. So it's pretty challenging to discover, you know, like uh, characterize uh, human genomes or discover SVs. And especially, you know, like because SVs are embedded within or around these longer repeats, many of these SVs are very complex. And in cancer genomes, if you study, you know, like uh, cancer genomes, there is this problem of like mixture of, you know, like tumor normal cells or like the, ca the cancer heterogeneity. So different cells may have, you know, different sets of uh, mutations. So for the most part, you know, SD colors currently rely on these hand-engineered features and heuristics to model SVs. So I'm highlighting like a few important signals that you can get from your alignment and infer SVs. And most of the SV colors, you know, like use an assortment of these signals to confidently say, uh, uh, what kind of SVs we see in different regions. So discordant parent read, you see, you know, like the discordance is between the ends of the, uh, your parent read. Red, read depth signal, you can see like the differences of uh, expected coverage of the genome when you align all the reads to the reference genome. A spill deck signal, if one single read is uh, broken over like a particular breakpoint, especially this is uh, informative for lo long read sequencing, and when you detect the uh, SVs with long read, or, you know, like change differences of the orientation of the reads. Uh, so, for example, you have like forward reverse strand, you know, like one end maps to the other strand, or, you know, like instead of like left, right, they, it's like right, left. So, like, for example, for duplication or inversion, this is a pretty informative signal. So I'm highlighting like a subset of SC colors that are available if we can read. Uh, so most of them are actually pretty good, but they, you know, like, are optimized for, you know, like certain event sizes or, you know, like certain technologies. Some work with short reads, some are like hybrid. So there is no really like a comprehensive SV color that works for every technology, every event type. So if you look at, you know, like the CGSI uh, videos from last time, there are like two good talks actually. One is by my colleague uh, John Alcon, sort of like highlighting uh, uh, different uh, methods for SV calling for different technologies. There's also like another uh, very good talk by Mike Schatz, uh, mostly like focusing on long reads, long read sequencing and SV calling with long reads. You can uh, check these calls at, uh, talks as well. Uh, so uh, again, like I'm highlighting this uh, major challenge of current SV callers, right? And the fact that it's difficult to scale to the vast diversity of SV types and sizes, and also it's difficult to adapt to different technologies or platforms. And as you, as you know, all these technologies are being improved, and we have always like uh, new technologies, so 
uh, it's a very challenging problem for uh, our field. So the question is, now that we have all these you know, deep neural networks, and they can learn you know, complex abstraction directly from the data, can we actually use them in sets? So instead of uh, having all these heuristics and statistical models, we use like a single deep, network, deep neural network that, we, that can actually learn everything from the data itself. Okay, I don't see an answer, but uh, uh, before going to the uh, SV discovery part, I also want to highlight like a su success story, uh, success story of uh, deep variant, which is a deep learning model applied to single nuclear variant like SNP and small indel discovery. Uh, so this is a paper by Google. They sort of advertise it as a data vis visualization plus deep learning model. So you start with uh, uh, read alignments. You can actually visualize reads. So basically every single read, you can actually see it in a, for example, IGV view, or you can create these images. Like they call it like pile-up images. And around, you know, like a potential uh, variant, these are like only single base variant, uh, you can see all the reads that align to that uh, region. And they use like a deep learning classifier for these images. So they start from read alignments, they go to these pile-up images, and they use like image classification. And they say, you know, they can replace, you know, like traditional statistical models, for example, GATK, that use like an assort assortment uh, of a statistical model component with just this single deep learning model. So this is a figure one of the deep variant paper. You can see on the left box, we have uh, a, a very simple overview of deep variant. So we start with uh, aligning all the reads to the reference genome. So we have uh, a reference genome and all the aligned reads. And then you can s essentially screen the genome and find you know, potential variants from your alignments. So for each potential variant, you can build these pile-up images. And if you have this trained uh, CNN, you can apply the trained CNN to the pile-up image corresponding to, this, to a particular variant. Uh, so the deep learning model can output you know, likelihood of different genotypes. For example, we can say if this was a heterozygous variant or homozygous variant or like a, just a reference uh, allele. Uh, so you can get the variant calls. So how you can, how you can train the data, uh, the CNN, it's also, it's pretty intuitive. If you get some labels, like correct labels, uh, from like a training pair, essentially like a, the pile-up image with the correct label, correct genotype, you can train a CNN. Uh, and uh, uh, an interesting uh, kind of component of this workflow is to build you know, these pile-up images. But that's also pretty straightforward, especially if, if you have just only CN, uh, uh, CNV, uh, SNVs. Because essentially, the visualization of all the reads can be the image itself. So you can have all the reads. So they have you know, multiple uh, channels for their images. You know, they, they encode, uh, for example, read quality, uh, the base itself, uh, the agreement between, you know, the, the reference genome, and some additional, you know, like uh, error models. So you can essentially, like, the, the base per quality and so on. So you can have all these, you know, like, stacked images, and you can feed this to, the, uh, to your CNN and get the, the probability of each uh, genotype. So this is like a high level overview of deep variant. But going back to the SV problem, we developed Q, which is a tool uh, uh, led by my colleague, Victoria Popik from uh, uh, the Broad Institute, to essentially use deep learning for SV detection task. So a high level overview of Q as follows. We, again, you know, convert sequence alignments to a multi-channel image. And then Q uses you know, these stacked hourglass graphs uh, convolutional neural nets to predict the type 
and also the genomic location of the, the SV in each of the images. So how Q converts sequence alignment to images, we can see on, the, uh, on this figure, we have two intervals on the reference genome. So we juxtapose is interval X and interval Y, and we use a function to convert the alignment signals in these intervals to a single pixel. So what are the alignment signals that we use? These are, again, you know, like similar to what people use for SV detection. For example, we can use uh, read depths or a split read, you know, like parent read. Uh, the change of orientations can have uh, uh, different, uh, different image. So essentially for each signal, we have an image. So I'm showing you here one of these images, one of the channels for the read depth signal. And uh, so the function, it can be like pretty simple, you know, like the, uh, just the change, the, the difference between, you know, like the, the depths of coverage in that uh, particular interval, okay? So you can see, you know, like these patterns can arise, you know, like for example, for deletion, so I'm also showing you, you know, like the, the IGV uh, view of these, the alignment in that particular region. So you can see, for example, here, you see my mouse, uh, so you don't see, the difference is uh, negligible, so you don't see like a, a red or, or blue uh, uh, pattern, but if there is like a change, here, you can see, you know, like different colors here. So there are like certain patterns associated with, with this change in, in depth of coverage. And you can essentially do this for other signals as well. So in the next figure, I'm showing you a figure which contains actually four different events. So we can have actually multiple events in a, in a single image. Uh, so we have like a heterozygous deletion, heterozygous inversion, a homozygous deletion, and a duplication. And you can see, uh, you can have, you know, like different channels uh, showing, you know, like different signals coming from these events. So this is a read depth channel uh, for, you know, like all of them. And you can also see, you know, like the uh, right left pair channel, which is uh, associated with this duplication, or, you know, like left left right right pair, which is for the inversion, and so on. Yeah, what was the question? Yes. Okay. Sorry, say it again. So, just wanna... so, so like that, like the X axis and Y axis, are those just two like different like? No, 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 no. This is like one, this is all reference genome. Oh. Okay. So this, we have like one reference genome and everything is compared with the reference genome. Okay. okay. So these are like intervals on the reference genome. You can, they can be the same interval. So for the most case, we have just the same interval. In this case, it's the same interval. But because we also want to capture, you know, like longer SVs, we can shift these intervals along the X axis and Y axis. So we can like shift a few times, so we can actually capture uh, larger events as well. But here is like the same interval on the same reference genome. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Uh, so we create the images, and then we uh, use the stacked hourglass network to essentially build these confidence maps. So we have, uh, uh, once we train this, uh, uh, this is like a sort of like a CNN model with these, you know, like additional hourglass shape uh, modules. Uh, so you, ha you, you feed, you know, these end channel images to this network. And the output of the model is these confidence maps. So I'll have another slide kind of showing you in detail. But the idea is that you would highlight pixels on these confidence maps that sh uh, show a potential breakpoint for your structure variation. Uh, and once you have these maps, you can do a post-processing and get the C calls. So these maps are actually based on, you know, like, different event types and also their zygosity. So for example, for deletion homozygous, we have a map for inversion homozygous and these and so on. So you, you, ha you have, you know, like uh, different uh, 
outputs from your model. And you can actually have, you know, like multiple highlights in one map as well. So you can have uh, events that are very close to each other, which uh, a lot of uh, methods actually ignore. So how we can benchmark and evaluate Q? Uh, so the main challenge actually here is now to, to generate training data. So the algorithm part is pretty uh, much solved now. We can uh, use this deep neural network. But can we generate like solid examples of positive and negative uh, SV types? And this is a actually pretty challenging task. Uh, so obviously we can do simulation. So we can generate as much as uh, simulated data as we want. Uh, so we use uh, Survivor to simulate uh, a wide range of uh, uh, SV types. For example, highlighting here, you know, like we can have deletions, tandem duplication, inversions, and some examples of these complex events, like overlapping events, for example, inverted duplications and uh, inversions flanked by, by deletions. We can also do subclonal SVs if uh, the SV is happening in only like a fraction of cells, in, uh, which happens in some of the real uh, cancer genomes. But again, if you want to capture, you know, like uh, more real genomes, we need, you know, like to use uh, examples of uh, real SVs from real genomes. Uh, and there are some data sets, for example, genome in a bottle, they have a very nice benchmark set, but mostly on uh, only insertions and deletions in some of the less challenging uh, uh, regions of the genome. There are like call sets from the 1000 Genomes Project or you know, like some of the TCJ call sets. So a good task is to sort of like find like a very good benchmark set that we can actually train Q uh, with it as well. But even with simulated data, Q already does a very good job. So I'm showing you like a, a few results here. Uh, so these are figures from a paper, as I said, by Victoria. Uh, this is uh, already on BioArchive, and it's probably coming out uh, very soon. So you can check uh, all the figures and, and some of the details of the algorithms and, and results. But as you can see, uh, this is the benchmarking on simulated data, so panel A. You can see when you compare Q with uh, Delhi, Lumpy, Manta, and Suaba, these are the state of the art uh, SV colors that are available at the moment. Uh, Q consistently has a very good precision and recall, and it has the best F1 score. Uh, on panel C, I just want to highlight this, this panel because you can see if you only look at you know, complex SVs for the that is inversion deletion and inversion duplication, most methods don't do a good job because you know, like it's, it's very challenging to kind of combine all the signals from you know, like these complex uh, overlapping events. Uh, but Q can do a very good job and uh, uh, it's, uh, the performance is, is much higher. We also looked at the real data sets. This is uh, the benchmark set from genome in a bottle. Uh, so it, we can only do it with deletions because there's no inversions around, uh, or other complex events here. So as I said, Q was trained only on simulated data. But when you apply to the real genome, this is a uh, HG002 genome, the Ashkenazi son from genome in a bottle, you can see again when you compare it with, you know, Delhi, Lumpy, Manta, Suaba, Q again gets the highest F1 score. So it's uh, very promising. Even without, you know, showing examples of real data, with only simulated data, you can do a very good job with, with deletions. I also want to highlight a few events here. So you can see on panel B, uh, this uh, event number one and event number two, for example. So event number one is a is an event that is only found by Q, so other methods didn't find it at all, like Delhi, Lumpy, Manta, they didn't find it. So it was a false negative for those methods. And 
as you can see here on this panel C, this was a deletion of a line element, which is a repetitive element. So it's like 6 kb uh, uh, mobile element that was deleted when you compare it with the reference genome. And you can see, you know, that there are a lot of reads mapped to the reference genome with, with MAPQ0 because they were mapped in other places as well. But uh, other methods, you know, didn't find this deletion because when they combine, you know, uh, different signals, you know, maybe they didn't see like, uh, they just ignore this uh, events because of their heuristics. Uh, but Q, because we showed examples of these line deletions, it can easily find these events. So you can clearly see on, on this panel uh, here, if you look at the read depth channel for only map Q greater than zero, you can clearly see the deletion pattern. Uh, example two here, that was an example uh, that was found by other methods but Q. So Q didn't find it, but other methods found it. And this is like the, the IGV plot for that event. So I guess because uh, uh, you could see there are, you know, like some uh, uh, highlights for, you know, like speed read or read pair signal. So other methods found, uh, called it because they could see, you know, like these uh, read pair, for example, signature here. Uh, but Q didn't find it. And I guess uh, when uh, we, we kind of look at it carefully with, for example, long reads, you can see, you know, like this was actually like a, a, a duplication, sort of like a, a divergent repeat in the reference genome. So you can kind of see like the same signals. Uh, especially when you look at these RL pair channel, so it's a, you know, like instead of like left, right, you have right, right, left channel. So you can see like there was, there might be like this divergent repeat interference. It was not a deletion, but other methods mistakenly called a deletion. So I think I have uh, any questions so far. So how, so deletion, uh, so you mean, uh, so deletion is a copy number event by itself, right? So you can, you can find these deletions and duplications. But, but if you're talking about, you know, like some more complex, you know, cancer genome copy number changes, we haven't trained on those models yet. So I think uh, for the last, I don't know, five, seven minutes, uh, uh, I'm gonna highlight uh, uh, some other applications of deep learning in my lab, uh, mostly on uh, digital pathology and also embryology. So I'm not going through the details. I just wanna like, sort of like introduce a problem and, uh, and see and say, you know, like deep learning can be applied to these sets of problems as well. So the first problem that is still like an ongoing project uh, led by my student, Matthew Brandon. He was uh, actually in CGSI for the first week. Uh, so, the pro uh, so the problem is uh, a weekly sub supervised model that can predict tumor purity from to, uh, histopathology slides. Uh, so if you can look at the, if you look at these figures here, on the left side, this is an original slide with annotations coming from a pathologist. And our goal is to get these predictions uh, automatically from a model. So you want to uh, essentially estimate the amount of tumor in the slide, but also want to see where the tumor region is. OK? So just to sort of like motivate the problem, we know that you know, like tumors are essentially a mixture of you know, cancer, uh, and normal cells, so there are a lot of different uh, cell types, and it is actually very important to, clinically very important to know or estimate the amount of tumor in, in, in your sample. So traditionally, you know, like tumor purity can be estimated, you know, the pathologist can manually look at the slides and, you know, like basically just 
get a, like a rough count of the tumor cells versus uh, other cells. There are also you know, computation approaches that use you know, molecular data sets, for example, DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing mostly to uh, estimate uh, tumor purity using sequence data. But for the most part, you know, like sequencing is still like very expensive when you compare to just like raw slides. And uh, uh, not a lot of agreements with uh, different methods. So I'll, I'm going to show you one slide uh, later. But as I said, you know, tumor purity is uh, uh, important clinically because, you know, like there are examples now that show, for example, uh, low tumor purity is associated with worse outcome in certain cancer types. And it's also important, you know, like to, if you want to like decide on tissue blocks that you want to sequence, it's good to sort of like find, you know, like the most tumor, uh, most pure part. You know, you don't really want to sequence, you know, like a lot of normal cells. Uh, so as I said, uh, there are not a lot of agreements with uh, pathologists and also uh, the molecular uh, methods. So this is like a uh, figure from a recent paper. You don't see a lot of uh, correlation with, uh, uh, among different methods. And we are formulating this problem now using these weekly supervised uh, uh, deep learning imaging models where you look at, you know, like uh, essentially we, we develop these like as attention based uh, uh, model that can actually find regions of the tumor and also uh, classify uh, different tumor purity in different bins. Any question? How much time do I have? Uh, you have um, at least um, 15 seconds. 10 or 15. Okay, that's good. Uh, so I don't want to take up too much time, but the next part is. Uh, so there's a lot of heterogeneity within the tumor. How is that reflected in the tumor purity score? That's a great question. Uh, for now, we do not dis distinguish, you know, like heterogeneous samples. So you, you only care about, you know, like tumor cells. But if you can, and and the, the and the reason is uh, we only use, you know, one label. For a for an image, because we want to do like a weekly supervised model, we only know you know like the percent tumor, like like ten percent, twenty percent, only one single label for the entire slide. But if you get labels from the patch level, you know like if you have pathologies that say okay like this patch is like LUAD, this patch is LUAC, for example, if you have uh, like a um, like heterogeneous long, long uh, sample, then you may be able to actually distinguish different, uh, uh, like kind of characterize the heterogeneity. Yes, and we use you know like a uh, like a consensus estimates of pathologists. This is from the TCG. So the, the, the data set that we use for training come from the TCGA data. Uh, so we had, you know, like an estimate from pathologists. So uh, the data you have, are they coming from a single type of tumor or all sorts of tumors? Like for different tissues or different... All sorts of tumors. tumors. So I think we tested for six different tumor types, uh, but you can generalize it to other, other tumor types. Okay, so the next project that I want to highlight is uh, application of deep learning in embryology and in vitro fertilization. So as most of you know, IVF often doesn't work. And the main question now is, can an algorithm actually help embryologists or even clinicians to make better decisions? So these are actually like uh, 
articles covering one of our, our papers a couple years ago. And to just give you some background on IVF, uh, about, you know, like 10% of families uh, in the reproductive uh, age, you know, like have problem conceiving. And there is a very high cost associated with IVF cycles. And still the success rate is actually pretty low. So often you can actually like go and see the success rate of each clinic, but it's usually below 50%. And for the most part, you know, like they uh, transfer more than one embryo just because, you know, like the, uh, the chance of a live birth is small. And this can actually lead to a lot of uh, uh, multiple pregnancies, especially like twins. So the chance of twins would be higher. And there is also this health complication for the mother and the child. One important factor in embryo selection is the, con is the aneuploid embryos because especially when the uh, uh, when we have like advanced maternal age many of the embryos are unemployed so there are like chromosomal abnormalities you might have like extra chromosomes or you know like some uh, larger scale rearrangements uh, in, in chromosomes and these unemployed embryos can lead to miscarriage or you know like some uh, comp uh, you know like complex complicated issues so for the most part, you know, like a success in IVF is associated with selecting the best embryos. So embryos that are healthy, they don't have uh, uh, chromosome abnormalities. And uh, for years in clinics, embryologists assess embryos from the morphologies. So they uh, have, you know, like different grading systems. You know, they, for example, look at, you know, like the expansion of embryos, the inner cell mass, the terfectoderm, like the area around the embryo. So they have, you know, like different grading systems that they use uh, in, in clinics. This is a non, obviously like a non-invasive model. It's only look at, you know, like a image of the embryo, but it's, uh, so the accuracy is not very good and it's not uh, a standard when you look at these measurements across different clinics. There are, you know, like fancier machines that they, some clinics use, for example, these time-lapse microscopy. So this is like an incubator uh, slash, you know, like a photography machine. So you can actually uh, monitor the growth of embryo, say from like day zero to day five. Uh, they can, you know, like take images from like different focal points, say like every 20 minutes. And essentially you, it's like a, uh, it's a time-lapse uh, imaging data that you can see the development of embryos. You can look at the morphokinetics, uh, the time points between cell divisions, and essentially the time to blastocysts. Uh, uh, so some, some labs use, you know, like manual assessment or, or like the embryology look at these like videos. Another technique is an invasive technique, uh, PGTA testing. So you can, essentially do a biopsy of like a few cells from outside the embryo from terfectoderm, send it to the lab, do DNA sequencing and see through sequencing if there are, you know, like chromosomal abnormalities. But this technique is invasive, obviously. So you have to freeze the embryo, uh, send sample to the lab and uh, it's costly. So usually like a few extra thousand dollars for, for each, uh, uh, you know, like sequencing. And because, you know, like there is like mosaism, you know, like different cells may have uh, different, uh, uh, some cells may be euploid, some cells may be aneuploid. There is uh, still, you know, like some false positive and false negative associated with this PGTA testing. So it's actually like still, you know, like a debate in this field, you know, whether uh, some clinicians recommend PGTA and some, some still don't. So, the project that we are working, as you can guess, is can we use deep learning imaging or looking at these videos to predict uh, aneuploid versus euploid embryo? So you can assess morphology and also with a pretty high confidence say if you have, you know, like aneuploid embryos versus uh, euploid embryos, using only images 
or you can also add you know like some clinical features for example like the age which is a very much a determining factor here or like some other features in in a single deep neural network so we published one paper a couple years ago there is another paper hopefully coming out uh, soon so i encourage you guys to check it and we can maybe talk later or like collaborate uh, on these uh, these applications so with this i want to thank the organizers again and thank uh, uh, some of the lab members who did uh, most of this work, collaborators at the Broad Institute, the Institution for Precision Medicine at Wild Cornell, and also our Reproductive uh, Medicine Center. And uh, also I want to highlight uh, some of the funding of the lab, so uh, thank to funding agencies, and we are also hiring at all levels. Thanks again.